committed to being more intense. Stewards is committed to being more intentional in the role we can play for racial justice. We also commit to being more inclusive of people historically and currently marginalized based on identity, including gender, sexuality, class, and heritage. We wish to publicly express that hate and systemic oppression have no home in our organization. For tonight, I will be monitoring the chat as well as keeping an eye on the YouTube stream. And now for what's most important, I want to introduce Carrie Guntor Seymour, your host for the evening. Carrie Gunter Seymour is the Poet Laureate of Ohio. Her poetry collections include Alone in the House of My Heart, Ohio University Swallow Press, 2022, and A Place So Deep Inside America It Can't Be Seen, Sheila Nog Gig Editions, 2020, winner of the 2020 Ohio Poet of the Year Award. Her work has been featured on Verse Daily, Cultural Daily, World Literature Today, The New York Times, and Poem A Day. A ninth generation Appalachian, she is the editor of I Thought I Heard a Cardinal Sing, Ohio's Appalachian Voices, funded by the Academy of American Poets and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Women of Appalachia Project's anthology series, Women Speak. Gunter Seymour is a retired instructor in the E.W. Scripps School of Journalism at Ohio University, an artist in residence at the Wexner Center for the Arts and a Pillars of Prosperity Fellow for the Foundation for Appalachian Ohio. Please join me in welcoming Carrie Gunter Seymour. <laughs> Thank you, Adam, so much for that wonderful introduction. And I always love that you speak about the land and uh, our obligation to those uh, who once lived here. Um, I want to thank all the wonderful folks at Stewart's Opera House. Um, Devin's not with us tonight. Those of you who are regulars uh, may realize he's not with us tonight, and he's very busy. He's uh, working on the Rocky Horror Picture Show live theater event, and we're very excited for that coming up. I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening and uh, all of you who will eventually stream our program from Stuart's YouTube page and my personal Facebook page and Twitter pages, <laughs> all available just after tonight's event. I want to also thank our ASL interpreters tonight, Joe and Nico who work their fine magic as they dance our words. And I wanna thank Devin and all involved for setting up transcriptions as well. So for those of you who care to, you can click on transcription tonight and read as well. So I am a pale skinned woman with long, straight, blondish gray hair. I wear glasses. The rims are tinted navy blue. I'm wearing a red paisley shirt with a pink collar. And I'm coming to you tonight from Newark, New Jersey, my hotel room where I am serving as a festival poet for the amazing Dodge Poetry Festival. Now, this is our second event for the fall of 2022 season, and I am so excited, as I know all of you are as well, because we have with us tonight the 2021 Ohio Poet of the Year, Cortez Harris, and the 2022 Pulitzer Prize winning poet, Diane Seuss. And because someone had to step away, I will read a handful of my own poems this evening as well. And we'll have a short Q&A after the readings. So please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A or later, you can type them right into the chat window and I'll look for those. And now, Cortez Harris is a poet from Springfield, Ohio, and the Ohio Poetry Association 2021 Poet of the Year. Harris is the author of We Made It to School Alive, an amazing full-length collection of poems published by 12 Arts Press. 
and Nothing But Skin, a poetry collection published in 2014 by Writing Nights Press. We Made It to School was inspired by his work as a teacher and gives voice to the experiences of the children he works with every day who deal with structural barriers, intergenerational poverty, educational negligence, and more. He is the first recipient of the Barbara Smith Writer in Residence at 12 Literary Arts and a 2020 Baldwin House Fellow. And his poetry and ideas have been featured in The Plain Dealer, Ideas Stream, City Club of Cleveland, and The Vindicator. And as I mentioned, in 2021, Harris generated a, an acclaimed literary agent who has built a staggering roster of visionary writers. His works in progress are two picture books and a young adult novel in verse. I had the pleasure of reading at an event with Cortez not long ago, and I was taken not only by his work, which is just amazing and extraordinary, as well as his voice, but also by his generosity of spirit and the stark honesty that dwells inside his work. It is my joy to welcome Cortez Harris to Spoken and Heard. Um, thank you, Carrie, for um, your generous offering of my volume of work. Um, I am very, very delighted to be able to share um, my work and to chat with um, anyone who has any particular questions about my work. So um, the very first poem I would like to read is the very first collection in my book. Walk to school. He carries his little brother to school on his back, tells him our hood is a forest of ravens. Everyone makes it out alive. Classmate folds his homework into paper airplanes, points it towards the sky, tries to fly with it. Across the street, a little girl plays hopscotch inside chalk outlines. And just bear with me, I want to find uh, my order um, for the ASL interpreter. So just give me a Quick moment. I lost it um, in my phone. Give me a quick moment. Let's stay. I'm so sorry. I'm going to do my poem, Ocean. <clears throat> my son runs his hands across a puddle outside our apartment. Pretends it's an ocean he can swim in. I sent him to the school I dropped out of, hoping this time the teacher will hand him a telescope so he can see the world for himself. My, my son's desk looks how I left it. His teachers still haven't told him the world is a sea of wells. He watches YouTube in class as proof that somewhere water is wider than his classroom. At recess, I used to swing high as the moss, push high enough. I almost saw beyond the rooftops. I can still feel the hands. I hope he doesn't grow up like me, holding down mop buckets just to keep the water running. I pray he can swim as far as his hands chooses to reach, where there is no cliff, no shore, no horizon. I always thought Glenville 
was the whole damn universe. And the sun and moon only had my son to look after. I haven't left, can't afford a U-Haul to carry our shit across the street. My son keeps begging me to take him to see the world. I am afraid there are only swamps for him to dip his head in. Went to a parent teacher's conference. A poster hung from some nappy ass cobweb bread. You can do anything if you put your mind to it. I told my son that poster won't move us out the hood, but that isn't to say his mind isn't a grenade. If he uses it, he could explode into a sea of reefs. Um, thank you, Carrie, for um, putting, I hope that was my next poem I ought to be reading, reading next alive because I can't seem to find my order. Um, but uh, if you could continue to do that, I will greatly appreciate that. Um, alive. Shoes sprawled across the floor. Stefan blows bubbles across the classroom. They disperse into glitter. Children dive into bean bags as if they are plastic pools. Marshawn stands on his desk, tries to grab a cloud or two. Michelle, Cadence, play hide and seek under their desks. My God, my black students are alive. And just two more poems. My next poem is entitled Womb, Womb. Mr. Harris, we don't have a lot of money. We have one bedroom apartment with books as amenities. Before my daughter was born, I bookmarked her. Wanted her to know she would likely become a story I was preparing her to read. My womb is an archive. When she was an embryo, a leaf I read fell in love with her. The lips she formed reads to me now. She found my baby tooth inside the mouth of my favorite book. Some magical habits can become a new universe. Thank you. And my last poem, it's my shortest poem in my collection. It's entitled, Good Day. Sound of a lawnmower, birds chirping from the corner store, no kids pulled over, busy chasing squirrels on bikes, hula hoop circles projects, not a single bullet pierces the sky. Thank you. Cortez, I uh, just have to tell you, you always just lay me out. I mean, I love your work so much. And um, I, I made note of this. I sent him, to, I, I may not have this exactly right. I sent him to the school I dropped out of. Mm -hmm. I sent him, this is your son. I sent him to the school I dropped out of. Mm -hmm. You know, you want him to have a better life, hoping this time the teacher will hand him a telescope. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is just so beautiful and that you're willing to share that with us. I mean, you're a great success now. Um, and that gives us all hope and, and uh, encouragement as well, because you dropped out of school, but you're OK. We don't want people dropping out of school, but there are options. In, and then now as a parent, you, you, of course, want your son to be challenged. And I think what I interpret is that's what happened. You, you got into school and you were never really challenged. It, it didn't seem like where you belonged. And so you end up leaving. And maybe I have that completely wrong, but um, that's the way I, I interpreted that poem. And we all have that ache for our children, you know, that we want the world to be better for them. And then with your poem, Good Day, I mean, right in our face. Thank you for the honesty, the teaching moments you provide to us. I, I, I've written all these down. Um, 
Uh, for those of us who truly have no idea what it's like to be a person of color, you are educating us in a way that is not confrontational. It's just facts and beautiful. And, um, and I just love that. And I want to thank you for that so much. And I hope you keep writing and I have some questions for you later. So we will talk again later. <laughs> but thank you so very much, Cortez, for your wonderful, wonderful work. Okay, as I said, um, uh, somebody had to step back, so I'm going to read a couple of poems with you this evening. I don't do that very often, um, but I'm going to read from my new book, Alone in the House of My Heart, which uh, officially came out on September the 27th, though I know many of you um, invested in the pre-sale, and I thank you for that. And on the back, at the very top, you'll find a blurb from Diane Seuss which is so wonderful and I'm so grateful for that. So um, if you are interested, uh, it is Ohio University Press. And I also want to mention that you can find uh, Cortez's book, We Made It to School Alive at 12 Arts Press. So um, if you're looking for his book and I'm also putting it in the chat tonight, but I know those of you who will be watching on YouTube and Facebook won't have access to that. So. Uh, we made it back to school. We made it to school alive at 12 Arts Press and alone in the house of my heart at Ohio University Press. Because autumn always clotheslines me. Already the sumac ripened, rusty red leaves stark among the greens. Not yet, I say. I say it every August, though leafy lime katydids warn me, chameleoned against the Japanese maples, suddenly out singing even the cicadas. Stink bugs feast in the garden. A melancholy thistle bends to a rumor of breeze. So that's my autumn poem to kind of get things uh, going for me tonight. Um, and um, this next poem, I know uh, many of us um, have or will go through the experience of caring uh, for our elderly parents. And um, as I'm finding out, those of us who are poets are writing about it. Um, so I'm going to share a couple of the poems I wrote in honor of my mother who passed away in a nursing home during the lockdown. And so for the last almost six weeks of her life, I was not allowed to see her, which was uh, pretty hard to deal with. And so I write about it because that's therapy, right? So this is Do Not Disturb. Whatever it was that held mother together all these years is unraveling like a daytime soap opera. Turned out like the dusk of her underbed, pacing the kitchen, hands churning air, as if word for word was the same as moment by moment, repetition the answer to prayer. During the Great War, electricity was used as cure. Volts routed through fractured cerebellums or directly on sectors of the body where derangements were manifest. Those enduring matters of the heart often undone by the overzealous. Cracked as a broken mirror and all its mess her hours declined to halves, halves to minutes, an empty frame, all that remains of the what, the where, or the not of her. Um, I think I'm going to skip outside her window and I'll move on to I Look for My Dead Mother in New York. So again, um, I would uh, 
like to point out that um, it was a very surreal experience to know that my mother was in the six, last six weeks of her life. We did know because she was, she was quite advanced uh, in her dementia and it was obvious that she was in the last uh, days of her life. And I wasn't allowed in um, even to come up to her window. They just weren't even allowing that. I think everyone was so very, very paranoid in those first few weeks when the shutdowns began. And, um, and the thing that gave me solace is knowing that I was keeping others from perhaps getting the virus by not hanging around and, and not being with her. And in the, the, the one blessing was the dementia, actually, because um, I don't think my mother realized that I wasn't there per se. And there were lovely people taking care of her. So this poem is called, I Look for My Dead Mother in New York. I lie fetal inside the Statue of Liberty's torch. The one displayed, removed in 1984, now displayed in the lobby. Its warped copper frame, a coiled energy about to unwind, swoop like a wood thrush. I was not the daughter my mother needed. She often warned, Lord, don't never have children. Aren't all of us born to be the receptacle of our parents' flame? God, the most popular protagonist. Like the lady, my mama was most beautiful in sunlight. Puckered apron, trowel in one hand, Bible raised in the other, tired, poor. She kept a clean house, grew collards and heirloom tomatoes striped to steaks like sinners begging the lash, sewed all my clothes a wisp of prayer with every up down of the needle trusting one day her willful daughter would fettle herself out healed under my mother's eyes the smudge of every lusterless day she endured this dream a wood thrush taking wing tittering too late, too late. So uh, during the pandemic, I spent a lot of time on Zoom as the poet laureate, you know, I went lots of places and I, um, and I made a decision, I made a pledge to take on the really rough topics. And we just don't talk enough about addiction in this country. We convince ourselves that addiction affects only the weak, the lazy, the poor. This is not true. It's a national tragedy. Um, and you all know who are regulars and those who are new tonight, that little twang in my voice, I am Appalachian. And it's real easy to say that, oh, you know, Appalachians are either drunk, stoned, or on drugs. And again, that just is not true. And it is a national tragedy. It's not an Appalachian one. So I, I do write a good number of poems about addiction. And this is one I'd like to share with you all this evening. It's called To Save a Life. We did what we could, hid the bottles, Drove what was left of him deep into the yawning hollow. Built a campfire. Drank water from a long-handled gourd, a galvanized bucket. We set up tents for triage. Counted his breaths. Worried over irregular heartbeats. Sweats. Persistent vomiting. His jacked up adrenal system. We waited, listened for a canvas zipper in the night, each long, slow pull, a call to duty, our legs folding over duct-taped camp stools tucked tight around the fire, 
his gut fucked stories stenched in blood and munitions overpowering the wood smoke's curling carbons. Crows haunched on branches behind our backs, sentinels silent as we wept. We doused him in creek water, a sharp sheen of moon over our bones, recited communions, sang songs our mothers taught us in the womb. Every neighbor dog and coyote within earshot, barking hill to valley. Some people think they don't deserve to be loved. Every story scratched into the dirt and ache. That week, down in the lower 40, we all got born again. It was hard to say who saved who. So I'm going to move on to the poem titled Tonight the Winds. The winds tonight could be beautiful if they didn't feel so raw boned. I watched the yard shift, spring blooms ripped from stems, bodiless wings, mangled chroma littering the grass, the creek blurbering. I'm toting a notebook, a stray felt tip pen, pink ink, scraps of verse ride climbing currents. I take them as they come. Consider failures, margins of loss, each word a blush. Soon, rain will muscle its way insist on its place i will run fawn fleet in the pale leaf light notebook a slip shod shelter pray none of the bones the creek spits up will be mine and one last poem for you tonight entitled Rorschach test. Consider daffodil, whoops, let me start again. <laughs> Consider daffodil blades in the crackling cold of February, those green thumbs up breaking through earth's rind, obliterating doubt. What's left of winter, suddenly endurable. What tethers us to the tentative? to contingencies, to the life force we're designed to abandon from birth. I'm reluctant to call it destiny, knowing too well which neuroses rush forth from that word, sifted through lobes and sockets to lubricate our worry. Listen, there are things to love about failure too. Sometimes we make mistakes, call them coincidence, trapped like thirsty sponges between memory and the moment, our imagined selves the deal we make. Aren't most of us in fact still children mishandling oversized bodies, echoing songs seated in our mind's eye? We pump our legs on a playground swing, avoid the dare to jump. The grass beneath our feet healed to death. The slaughtered ground, a pit of sharps and flats. Scars, the shape of shattered hearts stamped into our elbows and knees. Thank you all so much for uh, for listening to my poems tonight. It was a great honor to read tonight with uh, with uh, Cortez and Diane. And without any further ado, 
Diane Seuss's most recent collection is Frank Sonnets from Grey Wolf Press and is the winner, as if we, nobody would know this, but the winner of the 2022 Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. Still Life with Two Dead Peacocks and a Girl, also from Grey Wolf Press 2018, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize in Poetry. Four-Legged Girl, Grey Wolf Press 2015, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Diane Seuss is a 2020 Guggenheim Fellow. She received the John Updike Award from the Academy of American Arts and Letters in 2021. Seuss taught in the creative writing program at Kalamazoo College for many years and has been a visiting professor at Colorado College, the University of Michigan, and Washington University in St. Louis. She was raised by a single mother in rural Michigan where she continues to call home. And like so many who I invite to Spoken and Heard, I know Diane from interacting with her through social media. I'm a huge fan like all of you as well. And as an observer of her interactions with others online, I can tell you this, Diane is kind and incredibly generous in word and action in Appalachia, we say it like this. I have never once seen Diane get above her raisin. And for those of you who are scratching your heads at that, let me assure you that it is a high, high compliment. And it is my great honor to welcome Diane Seuss. Thank you so much. What a beautiful introduction. What a gorgeous, gorgeous introduction. And I'm so moved to be reading tonight with Carrie and Cortez, who, you know, are writing poems about real stuff, parenting and addiction and teaching and schools and, um, you know, the stuff that compose our lives. So thank you for the beautiful readings, you two. And, um, Thanks to all of you who are listening and to our fabulous ASL interpreters and Adam, our tech person, and to Stuart's Opera House for virtually hosting us. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna read some poems from Frank Sonnets, my most recent book. And again, thank you, Carrie, for inviting me to, uh, to be part of tonight. Okay. The problem with sweetness is death. The problem with everything is death. There really is no other problem if you factor everything down which I was no good at when studying fractions. They were always using pi as their example. Rather than thinking about factoring things down, I wondered what kind of pi. And here I am, broke, barely able to count to 14. When people talk about math, they say, you'll need it to balance your checkbook. What is a checkbook and what indeed is balance? Speaking of sweetness, for a time I worked in a fudge shop on an island. After a week, the smell of sweetness made me heave, not to mention the smell of horses. It was an island without cars, shit everywhere. When I quit, the owner slapped me. I love the sign for slapped there. I'll be pausing between poems just to make sure our interpreter can stay up with me. 
From this bench, I like to call my bench. I sit and watch my tree, which is not my tree, no one's tree, the quiet, except for barn swallows, which are not loud birds. How many exclamation points can I get away with in this life? Who was it who said only two or maybe seven? Bishop, Marianne Moore? Either way, the world is capable of quiet if everyone stays indoors and no jet planes. My tree, it just stands there in the middle of everything, in a meadow, on the bay, looking what the philosopher called adorable. Then I drove the mile west to the sea, which had decided to be loud that day. The sunset, oh, ragged and bloody as a piece of raw meat in the jaws of some big golden carnivore. And I cried a little, for none of it, none of it will last. My earliest memory is telling myself stories without words, starring the decal dog, cat, and butterfly on my crib headboard. I couldn't talk yet. Then my mother coming in, in the room to pick me up. I lifted my arms. It must have been my mother, though, I've never called her mother in my life. I call her by her name, Norma, and I always have. Another early memory is getting lost in a toy store, finding my mother and encircling her legs with my arms, but it was not my mother. It was another lady, a stranger, and from then on, toys too were strange. The small oven that baked cakes with a light bulb, playing under a mock orange tree and in the abandoned chicken coop, finding out what I called violets was really petrified chicken shit. I'm going to skip the next poem, Interpreters, and move on to I Suck So Many Cough Drops. I suck so many cough drops that my pee is mentholated, not for pleasure, for pain. I cough, it hurts. Though as a kid, if given the choice of candies, I'd pick Vicks lozenges. From there, it was boys clothes. Wore a pack of candy cigarettes in the t-shirt pocket. Vicks in the pocket of my jeans. Had access to matches from the bowling alley. Charred the cigarette end once set the whole pack on fire. Yes, I played with the matches. No one knew or cared. That was my luck. I learned early to swallow pills so I could take knockoff one a day vitamins we got free from my mom's friend who worked in the pill factory. I'd suck off the sweet coating before swallowing the iron that made my little turds black. I was glad my dad was sick. It gave me access to him. I could sit next to him and hold his cold bones in my hands. 
trace the blue veins and the incision that wrapped his torso like a feather boa or a boa constrictor. I was a quiet child, but I schemed behind the silence. Already setting up the terms of my survival, like chess pieces whose royalty I coveted, black army on a stolen board. I'm going to skip the next one. This kind of moves out of childhood. All things now remind me of what love used to be. Swollen cattails in lonely places, gluey conditioner in my hair, firm books, their variegated spines swirl of words like a stirred cocktail, world umbilicus, pulsing asterisk. The past is this, to have been young and desirous and to be those things no more. In the future, the cattails will explode without me. I pray they will not go unseen. Who will ride the cemetery horses? Incorrigible blonde forelocks blowing in their eyes. Back when I walked through cemeteries, commenting on the strange names, the present tense to take a loveless path is to court a purple blue emptiness, like a disco or a grotto, or the cave where dead bodies are stored in the winter. <coughs> Excuse me, when a shovel can't break through frozen ground. I have seen such spaces, I've been alone in them sound of water lapping, animals calling to each other, echo of my own breath, smoke pouring from my mouth in the cold, memory interloper in the corner who means to kill, heavy rock in its hand, and poetry. This poem right now, this one night stand. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a tickle. And I'll just read one more. Um, I'm going to skip a few and um, I'll go to the next, to the last poem begins, takes time to get to minimalism. Takes time to get to minimalism, years lived through. Oh, the suffering. Yes, I'm in that camp. As Orr writes, we move from choked silence to blurred speech, to diary with its useless key, to story, to poetry, the most shaped, therefore most distant from the original crime. Even pleasure can be a crime, especially once it's lost. And happiness, the word and assault on the tongue why, the patient asked the doctor, 
does everything taste bitter as the stems of dandelions? Even the tongue tasting itself tastes bitter. When I was a child, one night, all I could smell was blood. I told no one. It went on like that for months until a torrential rain laundered the air. Khan, at 88, his lungs full of cancer, mind hijacked by dementia, can't remember his own poems nor holding a pen, though he accepts my reading them to him. That's a good one, he says, coughs, an urn-shaped moment, thus radiant, therefore true. Thank you very much. I can barely function. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, Diane. Oh my goodness. So I, I was sitting here making some notes, which I love to do um, when people visit. And one of the things I love about your work, one of the many, many things is you're, you're so sneaky with your wit. You know, I mean, you're just real serious and all of a sudden you sneak it in like um, your first poem about um, when studying fractions, um, they used pi. Uh, and we've all had to to do that. They use pie, and you're using pie as an example, and I never understood pie either. But but you admit that rather than thinking about the math, you're thinking about what kind of pie is it, you know, which is just so very real and so very um, childlike. That's how we are, you know. And and um and I love that. I love it. I mean, you practice that in many of your poems where you're starting out serious and all of a sudden you just sneak in with a, a, a bit of wittiness that is just so powerful and wonderful and then turn it right back around again, you know, and you, I love that the way you kind of jerk us back and forth, but you always take us, you know, right where we need to go. Um, I think you're in, I know you've heard this a million times, but I've got to say it, you're so visual, you, you know, um, in particular, I wrote down about the candy cigarettes in your pocket, you know, I can see you strutting around with those candy cigarettes in your pocket, and those Vicks candies in your jeans, looking for matches. I can absolutely <laughs> see it. So now I know you were a very ornery child, but um, I think that comes from the single motherhood. And I love that you would trust us all enough to share that you call your mama by her first name, Norma. I think that's beautiful. And it speaks to your relationship, which um, which we're gonna get, maybe get into here in a minute. But I think um, I always, for some reason, I don't know if this is true with everyone else, but when I read your work, I kind of feel like you're writing, like to me, like you have engaged me to that level. And that's why you're the Pulitzer Prize winning poet because you do that. I feel like you are writing a message to me and I am able to interpret it and 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 gasp at it and, and ponder it. And, um, and I'll be honest, when I read your book, I could only read a few at a time because they had so much, they're so rich. And there's and and um and they deserve the time. They deserve that time of just reading maybe a couple at each setting so that you can embrace them fully. Thank you so much. Thanks for understanding and for receiving, because that's part of of writing, isn't it? I mean, why write if it isn't received and heard? And I love that you feel I'm writing to you because I am. <laughs> um, you know, when I write, I think I'm at my best self. Um, it's, it's the way I know how to give. And um, I think you do that too. And Cortez too. Um, you know, I, um, I feel that so much in, in both of your work, the, just the hum it, it makes me feel I feel like I'm gonna cry, but it makes me feel more human to hear work about human things. Um, so thanks. Thank you very much. 
Thank and thanks you. to my wonderful interpreter. <laughs> so Cortez, I'd like to invite you to put on your video again and turn on your mic. And um, does anybody, if anybody in our audience would like to put a question in the chat or the Q&A, I do see one in the Q&A. Real quick, um, I think you probably caught it, but if you're looking for Diane's books, you can find them at Grey Wolf Press. So that's where to order hers. Mine is um, Ohio University Swallow Press. And we have um, Cortez at um, 12 Arts Press. And that's mostly for our online folks who are going to watch later because they don't get to have the chat window. And for all of you here with us tonight, all the links are in the chat. You can buy them right now if you want to. Listen to me being a big old salesman here at book sales. But anyway, <laughs> it does help our, our, our presses if you, um, if you do that. Uh, so let me look at the Q&A here. Okay, it says anonymous attendee. Diane, I so admire the turns in your poems. Do they usually come during your initial drafts? Many thanks. Good question. Um, yes. Um, maybe especially in this book, but it's kind of how I work. Um, the, the, the first draft is usually pretty much intact. That is, um, I trust the movement of my mind and the movement of my imagination. And so I can clean up syntax and music and, and all, but the, the images, the movement of the poem, I think comes in the first draft. Thank you for that question. And I know other poets uh, work differently. So that's just what works for me. Okay, so I have, while y'all are pondering, I have a couple of questions that I will ask you all, and we'll see if anybody else comes through with one from the audience. And Cortez, it is my understanding that you made a decision to leave teaching for a bit to become a full-time writer because you got this amazing agent who I do believe approached you, which is like, wow. I mean, how does that happen? I'm so happy for you. And I thought, you know, I admire that so much that you took that leap and decided to really focus on your writing. And so I wondered if you could just share with us, um, you know, without having to reveal too much of yourself, but you know, how you made that decision. Uh, because I think there are, are many of us who would like to make that leap, but still kind of on the fence. So maybe you can help us out. Thank you for that, um, Carrie. I first want to say, um, Diana, you're, and I said in the chat, your writing is visually staggering. Um, I just, I'm really like enchanted by like the childlike sensory in your writing. Like the child sees everything without words. Um, the child as an observer. Um, I was introduced to you through your poem Ballad. And from that point on, you working through the grief of losing your father and the line, like, and I know Carrie mentioned like the, the, the very detailed visual, like in that ballot poem, you said, you know, the, the, the two crooked, like minds, like it's, when I was, when I read and I mull over your work, I'm like, writing is through observation, um, the small object, the small item. So thank you for um, really um, allowing me to have faith and trusting the movement of my own mind because mm -hmm. that's very revealing. So thank you. I feel like just listening to you, I'm a better writer. I think mm. all of us listen to you, we're better writers. I know Carrie. What a beautiful thing to say. And you know, <laughs> I noticed you, there was a tooth in one of your poems, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. What is that line? Because I wanted to write it down. <laughs> um, she found uh, my baby tooth inside the mouth of my favorite book. Oh my God, that's such a great line. We I should mean, do an well, anthology of absolutely. two poems. <laughs> there we go, yep, an anthology of two. Oh. Um, so, and Carrie, to answer your question, um, that's a loaded question. Um, and I'm gonna do my best to try to like uh, consolidate my response. Um, you know, I, I honestly, here's the thing. When I got, when I first garnered a literary agent and um, and I, it was a very um, agonizing um, process. I mean, because my agent happens to be a writer and an editor. 
Um, so she describes herself as I'm not a post delivery service. If you send me anything, we're going to revise it. Um, so I had to go to a rigorous editorial process and a lot of things I was trying to work on because I'm, I'm a poet. So I'm really used to like sparse text, nothing long form. I do believe I'm a prose poet. I really value um, the, like the narrator and the narrator in the um, in the work. And it's really hard for me to write lyrical poems. I can certainly appreciate it. So for me, writing a pro writing in prose was like, I'm ready to do this. Um, but I will say when after a year of me, um, I was working on a book, uh, a long form middle age um, novel, and it just the editorial process was just it was agonizing. And I was informed that I might be I might be writing the wrong book. And ironically, I decided to do a picture book biography because I am a teacher, um, former teacher. I taught second grade and I spend a lot of time engaging children with picture books and that's my way of like and I, and I spend a lot of time really trying to show kids become self-sustaining readers and picture books is one of them so a friend was like you should write a picture book biography and it just so happened that I've been studying James Baldwin and no one there's no picture book biographies about um, him his childhood his remarkable childhood so I decided to write a lyrical account and use my poetry to sort of write in a lyrical biography, nothing decorative, no decorative sentences, just very poetic. And um, and to, to be honest with you, though, and you mentioned Lee, I I, refer, I did an early recognition um, before I even had a book deal. I just, I, in my mind, I'm like, I need to save X amount of dollars, and I'm going to just I have a retirement an event that I needed. And I'm going to just write in a coffee shop, Phoenix Coffee Shop in Cleveland, and hopefully something happens. You know, it was really me realizing that. Um, and I know Diana, Diana, you you hit on this. You said I feel like I'm my best self when I'm writing, and I felt like I wanted to be more of my best self. And the only way I could do that is spend just because honestly, it wasn't writing as a vocation. It was more so like I'm leaving, not necessarily to write as a vocation, but I'm I'm leaving just to take my own um, sabbatical for a year and just write, you know? And I, I figure I might go to the back to classroom fi for financial purposes, but to be honest with you, I got a um, significant um, bu um, book deal amount. And I think for me, I realized, I looked at the data of like, you know, re the reality is um, the average advance, you know, for it's not, it's very marginal, you know? And I happen to got a significant amount. So I, I was like, oh, you know, I'm gonna be a steward over this opportunity because I understand that it's unprecedented the, the 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 my book deal amount. But I will say, when I got my book deal, the first thing I said to myself was, I'm excited to be a bridge for other writers. Mm. I have a really, um, I believe in my in my agent, and I knew at that point, I'm like, if I can get in this door, then I can open up the door for many people. So I was more excited about the possibilities and helping others to break into the major publisher, or if that's something they choose to do. And I feel like I have that path to support other writers, so. I love that. I love that. I, I have, I feel the calling to serve as well, obviously. And I love that when we can think of others, it enriches us so profoundly, you know, it really does. It puts icing on top of the cake every single time. Thank you for that. Now I'm seeing all kinds of questions coming up in the <laughs> Q&A. So let's see what we got. Okay. Um, so uh, I've got to let, I've got to take this one from uh, Laura Andre because uh, she's with my publisher. <laughs> she's with the Ohio University Press. So I'm going to have to do that so I can stay in their good graces. <laughs> she says, Diane, what made you decide to choose the sonnet form and how did you come to the point of making it your own? Because we know it's not necessarily a traditional sonnet, so to speak. So yeah, I'd love to hear you talk about that. And I know you've talked about it a thousand times, but let's have it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll keep it quick. So um, I knew that contemporary readers weren't going to want to read a big book of traditional Shakespearean sonnets. Um, you know, I can write them, but I felt like the form would be limiting to what else I wanted from the book because I considered it a memoir of sorts in sonnet form. And so um, some a couple of reviewers said, well, 14 lines isn't a sonnet, but I, I don't think it's that simple. 
Um, so they are all 14 lines, but also there's usually vestiges of rhyme in each poem, some more than others. There are at least lines that are metrical, maybe not the whole poem. And there's a turn um, in most of the poems after about you know eight lines. And then finally, there's always, I think, something that's kind of a couplet at the end and it may not rhyme but it's bigger you know like in the in the first sonnet in the book it's um how do i explain the search for beauty or relief so you know that's a more what a bigger statement a more rhetorical statement than the the more um image directed uh, lines and the rest of the poem so those are the things that I did to sort of hold to the sonnet while, you know, it became a container for my, my life, my voice. And so anybody who practices that form or any other traditional form, you're filling it with your own uh, spirit. Um, and then finally, I just, I really happened upon it, um, like I do everything else in my poems. Um, it just, I, the, when I came to the first poem in the book, um, it, it ended up, well, that gosh, that's 14 lines. And I like that sonnet thing. What if I wrote a, a memoir in sonnets? And it was sort of that quick. Um, <sighs> So I guess I trust my intuition and I really do feel like I rely on the spirits to guide me. Um, I think my own little self isolated from other forces in that smart, but um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I feel like I get a lot of help from the other side. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, man, I love that so much. Cortez, why don't you um, make a few comments about form? Have you have you worked in forms before? I know most of the work I've seen, you're kind of like me, you're kind of a free verse writer. Um, and maybe I'm completely wrong. So I want to give you a minute to talk about um, how you feel about poetic form or craft. Yeah, um, you know, there was this great book I read about about form and something that I I stuck to was um, using form to strengthen your free verse. Mm -hmm. So I'm very sensitive to form. Um, sometimes I use form and I break away from it. Um, I know she mentioned the sonnets. I like the crown sonnet. Um, I like poetry form, so like couplets, you know. Um, and yeah, I, I tend to gravitate towards form to just kind of give me um, sort of, I like, I, I do echo form, but I also like to bend form. Um, so yeah, and I, I think, and when I found, because I initially wrote in free verse, that was how I wrote in, um, you know, for my collection, I was looking at form, I'm like, oh, I, I really want to, I really want to learn them so I can bend them. And it will perhaps, you know, make my free verse a little bit more um, tightened. So yeah, I'm very, um, I, I like it. I, I like it. And, and it's interesting because um, the thing about, for me, when I hear sonnets and, I, and, and Diane, you mentioned this, you said, you know, I, the contemporary right, readers are not necessarily like too enchanted by um, uh, like, like traditional form, but like, I think that's the art of having permission to bend form. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, it's it just, or, it, for, I, I think it's also, for me, I consider it like play. You know, mm -hmm. just have fun with language. So, yeah, it's still there. You know, the bare bones of it are there to kind of, for me, a lot of what I write about in, in this book is heart is difficult, especially my son's uh, drug addiction. And mm -hmm. um, to feel that form holding me up was mm -hmm. very, very helpful. So, um, I think the more you go out on a limb in your work, the, the more you may need something other than sort of 
you know, when we say free verse, I think that's a form too, you mm -hmm. know, but I think we need to rely on, on form to, to keep us, um, you know, from flying off the page. Oh, that would just sound like a poem right there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have another question from uh, John Barry or Barry John. I don't know if it's backwards. Anyway, it says, uh, which is very kind. He says, all three of you read so beautifully. When you write, do you do so with the intention to read aloud? Do you feel it affects the way you write? I'm interested to hear the answer to that myself. Cortez. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I do, I do. I write for voice. Um, you know, I am someone who I, I'm very sensitive to the oral, um, literacy experience. So I like to hear speech. Um, I started writing through spoken words. So for me, it naturally, I generally, and, and sometimes when I'm writing, I'm, I'm almost like talking to myself out loud. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because sometimes when I'm writing, I can hear my voice. So when I'm reading out loud, it's like, oh, wow, like I'm re-listening. And I also feel like I hear other voices, too. Um, and, and I also feel like sometimes when I'm reading, I'm, 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 and I had this experience today, I, I, I feel like there's a spirited part of me who if I'm projecting, if I'm reciting out loud, then I like to think someone else hears their own voice. Mm -hmm. um, so I do read with the intent of using my voice. And I also personally like the experience of someone being able to listen in on me to strengthen their own voice. Mm. So. How about you, Carrie? Well, you know, I was just sitting here thinking about that question and you know, it's how I learned to make line breaks. Mm. I would read my work and then I would know where to break the lines because I was I was doing it naturally. Right. And so when I teach workshops, I always remind students, read your work out loud. Make sure you've got your line breaks in the right place. And it really helped me. That's just very rudimentary. But um, and but I have to say, I don't think I write my work thinking I'm going to read it to an audience. If that's part of this question, you know, am I thinking when I write this, um, how it's going to sound? But of course, I want the music in there. You know, of course, I want uh, to use devices that create music and cadence and um, and maybe take advantage of my twang a little bit, you know? <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yes, earlier on, Diane says my next book has to be titled Twang. So now I have to tell <laughs> Don't y'all steal that either. That's my <laughs> Um So I, I'm not as dedicated to it as Cortez mentioned he is, but, um, but I definitely read them out loud to myself because it strengthens them. I, mean, I can just tell if they're, they're weak. If they seem weak to me, then they're gonna seem weak to others as well. So I think that's how I approach that. But I'm the person here who is a non-trained poet. I'm a non-academic poet, so I have to come at things sideways. So y'all probably better not take my advice. I'm non-trained. I mean, I train myself like a dog. Like a dog. Yeah, me too. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I learned by reading and by doing. Um, but yeah, for me, I, I'm not thinking about the afterlife of the poem. But um, I do, I do compose in my head first. So I'm like chopping broccoli, and I'm thinking lines or when I had my doggies, I'd walk my doggy and you know, the lines would come. And so by the time I hit the page, it's, it's, I'm already hearing it, the music of it and how it's gonna live on the page. Um, but also I've been writing so long that I'm kind of aware of the voice that writes, you know, that lives in me. Mm. And it's, 
especially because I've lived alone now for quite a while, it's sort of my companion. Ooh, I love that. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's see here. Wendy Drexler, Diane, in my workshop, we are reading and discussing each Frank sonnet one by one and are almost at the oh. end. <laughs> Can't bear to say goodbye. Um, so we're going to go on to four legged girl. Ooh. Isn't that wonderful? A question about your poem, Romantic Poetry in the New Yorker. Oh, and I forgot to mention that. Forgive me, Diane, because that just happened. Well, we were just made aware of it. You would have known quite a while ago, I'm sure. But it says, are you thinking of a particular form with those 10 line stanzas? So maybe they're, yeah. Oh, smarty pants. Uh -huh. And can you share the shape or arc of your new book or are you willing to? Sure, I'm an open book, man, you know? Um, so, um, I, I do have, I did come upon, so, okay, the new book is called Modern Poetry, which was the first, um, poetry class I took, um, in college, in undergraduate school, and I knew nothing, 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 and, and the title poem is about sort of knowing nothing, um, and, um, and, I decided after Frank and writing these short sonnets that I needed to really change it up. I try to do that with each book. And so um, I decided to write mostly longer poems in free verse, which freaked me the heck out um, because, you know, I was kind of married to that form for four years or so. So we got a divorce, the sonnet and I. <laughs> And um, I started writing long um, with some shorter poems in between. But yeah, the arc of the new book, it's a, it's a lot about poetry. It's a lot about, um, not about the pandemic overtly, but about the political situation in the last few years and the, the pandemic and the isolation. And um, surviving it um, through language, sometimes not very well. Um, so those are the, I, I really put poetry up to the x-ray machine. And really it's kind of a book about deciding if poetry matters. So those are the stakes in the book. And the 10 line um, stanza, I just kind of decided if I do, you know, quite a few of the longer poems in the book, I'm doing that 10 line stanza. It just seemed 10 is a good number. <laughs> and um, I think, uh, I don't know, it just seemed um, sort of to call to old, old poems. I, I talk about Keats in that book and and other older poets. And I kind of hold on to them as a, as a source of connection. And 10 just seemed to help me do that. <laughs> I love that, I love that. Don't you ever think that if people listen in on poets talking about their process, they'd be like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're asking questions, so it must be working out okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, Cortez, did you get to tell us enough about your new projects? I mean, did we get titles or anything? And forgive me if I missed some of that. I get so excited sometimes that I uh, miss some of the details, but I want to be sure that you can tell us what you've got coming up as well. Yeah, so um, I will be, uh, so it's a three book deal. Um, he says so modestly, it's a three book deal. <laughs> it comes with uh, a lot of pressure. Oh. <laughs> Easy pressure. Um, but um, yeah, the first would be a book of, you know, a, a biographical account of um, Jimmy's remarkable childhood. Um, you know, he's one of the, I, I, I believe, uh, America's greatest writers and thinkers. And I'm just excited to talk about the child, Jimmy. Um, and then there is a book 
the second book, which will be a, another picture book, which, you know, I'm still a teacher at heart, so I'm excited to write for children. Um, and it's really me telling a story, um, which is an echo of my life. I mean, they may not know that, but my complicated reading history, I'm um, being someone who um, was a child and measured themselves based on the labels that was um, projected on me, such as having a IEP and poor reading comprehension, poor writing expression, and you know my complicated you know relationship with reading and writing. And um, so, yeah, what I want to do is I, the second book is it's my intent to sort of humanize a writer who is labeled a struggling reader or humanize a reader who's um, who have heard messages of you're not a reader. You know, I think we're all struggling um, to read. We're all trying to become writers. Um, no one has mastered the English language. Um, so I'm really excited about that project because I really I hear that a lot of from teachers like, oh, I've heard a story of a, a someone asking, quite frankly, a teacher, do you have a school library, a classroom library? And a teacher's response was, oh, we have a small library over there, but our kids can't read. So we don't really value just a, a classroom library. So I really want to just sort of like shift the paradigm. And instead of teachers saying, you know, this child cannot read, it's even proficient readers make mistakes in literature. Um, and even proficient readers, they trip over words. And even proficient readers have to go into dictionary and study language, you know? So I want to normalize that kid who is struggling, to, who allegedly is struggling to read. And then the third book is, it will be a middle age, you know, novel about, you know, my relationship to reading. I mean, it's, it's of course to be fictionalized, but it's all going to be sort of inspired through um, me, just my coming age with reading and writing and trying to just believe in myself as a literary citizen. <laughs> That's so cool. That's so great. I'm really excited about all of that. Some very important work. Yeah. And the person who saw that in you, saw all that in you and has taken it upon herself to make help you make this happen. You know, I think that's just pretty amazing and wonderful. And yeah. Wow. 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 Yeah, and I have and I and I have this and I, I it's wild wow because I wish someone told me early on that like, well, my experience that like writing happens at first. It's, it can be a very um, devotional like you know, solitary experience, you know? But like, once you get to like, trying to reach publication, you know, there's, there's editors, you know? And mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I thought that writing, you do it alone, all alone. Mm -hmm. the, and, and I'm learning like, oh, I have someone, I have a wonderful editor, a wonderful team. And it just sort of affirms that like, oh, it's like to write through this world, you need other people to support you along the way. So mm -hmm. that's just been a very revealing experience for me. Such a good point. Yeah. I'm so My glad editor you are at Gray Wolf is Jeff Schatz. And I mean, he's probably one of the closest, mm. you know, I don't even know what to call it. He's not family. He's not companion. He's not, I mean, we're friends, I think, but it's something else. And there, there's a way he knows me that nobody else does through looking so closely at my words and mm -hmm. you know to feel that support makes me much more likely to uh take a risk mm. like he's like the sonnet as a person <laughs> Yeah. I want somebody to say that about me. <laughs> I would say that about you. I no, would say I, that about you. I feel it. I feel it. Oh, well, thank you. I wasn't fishing for a compliment, but thank you. Fish, you know, girl. fish. This has been an extraordinary evening, and I want to know, Diane, was there anything else that you wanted to offer, or do you want to want to shout out a favorite, uh, 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 your current favorite poet, or anything else like that before we go? And, and Cortez, I'll be asking you as well. Mm, well, um, I guess I just want to encourage people not to just read what just came out or or what's current and contemporary, but um, look for the elders, you know, mm -hmm. um, 
because even when they're flawed, we can learn a lot from them. And um, more and more, I need, I need them. So that's all I'd say. Um, there's a great book out now. Um, it's a biography of Keats in um, that sort of both, it uses his poems and, and um, sort of literary criticism to tell his life story. And that book became so important to me as I wrote what's coming up. So yeah, read, read the elders. What about you, Cortez? Do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, well, you know, I'm going to be reading more of Diane. So <laughs> I I'll send guess. you a book. Um, Please send me I'm your gonna, address and I'll send you. I promise you, I'm that's who I'm going to be mulling over. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. Just thank dig you, thank you. More into your work, which I know. Is Same. Great. I'm so glad we made this connection I'm because so I happy. I hear you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Well, I want to I want to <laughs> remind everyone you can get Cortez Hare's book um, from 12 Arts Press. And of course, Diane's books come out of Gray Wolf Press, my own out of Ohio University Press. I thank you both so much for this just extraordinary evening. And I'll tell you, after a whole day of the Dodge Poetry Festival, and now this, I know I'm going to just collapse and I'm going to sleep so good tonight with all these beautiful words in my head. And most you need a piece of pie, man. I do. <laughs> what kind of pie? Sandwich. <laughs> That's up to you, sister. Yeah, I love it. I might have to sneak out for one. That's for sure. <laughs> But I do want to remind everyone uh, that our next event is November the 17th, and we'll have poets John D. Lee, Rosemary Watala Traumer, and our local um, Ohio poet Sandra Gill. And I'm so excited about all these wonderful poets. Um, extraordinary work, really, from these uh, three upcoming as well. We just never have a bad evening here at Spoken and Heard. We've been so lucky to have the most marvelous folks come and join us. So I do want to thank all who came out tonight and all who will stream later. I want to thank you, Devin and Adam, for having us tonight and all the fine folks at Stewart's Opera House. I want to thank Joe and Nico, our amazing ASL interpreters. And again, all of you for joining us tonight and when you stream. So until we meet again, be safe, remain vigilant just a little while longer. And I'll just say good night to everyone. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Hmm. Have a wonderful day. Cortez, send me your address on email. I, I, I will. Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to do all that. All right. Way. I'll send you books. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, bye. Bye, everybody. Thank bye. you, Carrie. Thank you for coming, y'all. Get some rest. Get, yeah. some, <laughs> get all this poetry crap out of your mind. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I, I'm about to watch basketball. Thank you. I need to hear that. Oh, watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Who's playing tonight? My favorite team, Clippers, Los Angeles. Oh, interesting. Yeah. You know, Detroit is doing. Uh, uh, really, really well so far. All right, that's good. You know, that's my team. I have to be loyal to Michigan, but of course. Yeah. So you live in Detroit? I I live in Kalamazoo, but um, I you know I can get the Pistons here. So awesome. it was wonderful talking to you. Oh, you too. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, interpreters. Nice. You're so cool. <laughs>